All right, this is Jeff Peacock again, and we're going to do lab number 11 this week. All right, and that's focusing on part number two, which is the cylinder. Uh, we don't have a whole lot to do on the whiteboard this week. We'll be mostly at the machine. By now, we've all gotten used to uh, the different features and how to make them, whether they're holes or reamed holes or threads and all that. So a lot of that learning at the machine is done. Now it's, these last two weeks are gonna be more practical exercises. The one last thing that I'd like to uh, talk about though on the whiteboard at this point is if you take out uh, your parts, or excuse me, your prints for part number two, which is the cylinder. We're go I'm gonna kind of reference that uh, throughout this. All right, so before, while you're getting that, I want you to take a look at this drawing here. All right, this is kind of what the cylinder looks like. It's not exact, but it's just an idea. We've, I want to talk to you about dimensioning these things. So dimensioning is a very important how, how you dimension things. And we'll, we'll find that out in just a moment. So right here, I've just got this part, and it's got two holes on it. All right. It is dimensioned um, this way in part A as coming from the bottom to this top hole and then a dimension coming from that top hole to this other hole, all right? Over here on part B, both of the dimensions are given off this bottom edge. So you'll see a lot, I see a lot of people dimensioning their parts using this. They'll take a side, say that's a datum, and then just pull all the dimensions from that one edge, which is perfectly fine if that's what needs to happen. But you have to understand if you do use one edge and make all your dimensions off that one edge, there can uh, be problems, all right? So let's look at let's look at number B, or letter B first, all right? So, let's just assume right now that all these dimensions are plus or minus five thousandths on all of these dimensions, okay? So, I didn't write in what the nominal, the nominal dimension is because it's not that critical. We're talking about a phenomenon called tolerance stack. All right, so if I'm looking at letter B here, this tolerance would be plus or minus five thousandths, and then this one would be plus or minus five thousandths, okay? So, with this hole, to make a good part, let's say, for example, that I was on the high side of this at the, at the maximum. I would have a positive five thousandths off the nominal dimension. Let's say I was on the low side for this dimension. I was on the negative side of the nominal. What these two will give me is a delta of ten thousandths. Okay? So, even though I've got plus or minus five thousandths, you think when you're designing something that, you know, a five thousand tolerance will be plenty good. But when you start doing like this, coming off of one datum, these two features can be up to ten thousandths. So imagine if we had 20 or 30 of these holes in a big long strip, okay? Things can start getting off all over the place, okay? So our tolerance has stacked and gave us something that's ten thousandths separation between these two features, okay? So, and that, that may be okay for your, for your design, but 
we have to think of what the emphasis of how we dimension this part. All right? What would the emphasis be on? The emphasis for this will be the relationship the relationship from the bottom edge to the features. Alright? The bottom edge to the features. So maybe in the design, this bottom is critical. Alright? And the placements of these holes to this bottom edge. If that is the case for what you're trying to do in your design later down the road in junior or senior design, then this is a very appropriate way of dimensioning. Okay? So let's jump over here to uh, example A over here. This is the way it's dimensioned on your drawing. By now you should probably have your drawing. In our drawing for a cylinder, we've got a dimension that goes up to the larger hole and then a dimension from the larger hole to the smaller hole. So let's look at how the tolerances uh, play with this, all right? So again, we still have plus or minus five thousandths here, plus or minus five thousandths here. All right, so whether, let's just say, for example, that this is on the high side and this is on the low side, or in the negative five thousandths. When we've done that, there's no added stack up between these two features. What's being controlled here are the relationship of these two holes. At most, these holes can only be a positive five or a negative five away from each other. So, these two will always be controlled within a five thousandths. So these holes are being more tightly controlled. Okay, so, in example A, What's the emphasis that this dimensioning tells me? Well, it's going to be the relationship between the two holes. All right, the relationship between the two holes are, is what's in in here. So I can only be five thousandths with these. They'll only move, I mean, them as a pair can move up and down this five thousandths either way, but they'll never get too far away from each other. So that's the difference of how we've dimensioned this. Again, letter B is has the features um, that are coming off the bottom edge. That's where the relationship is. Here, it's going to be the relationship of these two holes. So the reason we do it, the way we've dimensioned it for the part two, the cylinder in part two, is this way. Because those two holes play a critical, are critical in our design that they don't get too far away from each other. Because this hole on your cylinder is going to be able to pull in and, and exhaust out the cylinder, all right? So, and this is going to sw swing on an arc when it gets moving. So this whole location is important. That way it can get and, and it, it get air in and exhaust it out. All right, we're continuing with lab number 11. We're going to make the part number two, which is our cylinder. 
Uh, so, so far throughout the semester, we've learned how to make all these different features that we find on our parts. All right, so now we're kind of taking, a, those are kind of taking a back seat, and then now we're going to start developing strategies and coming up with game plans on how to make these parts. Okay, so understanding how you're going to make these parts greatly affects and helps you actually in how you design parts, all right? If you as a designer can think about what it may not be necessarily you, but a tradesman is how they're going to attack and accomplish what you're trying to design, it lends itself to usually a lot better design, okay, overall. So if, we, if you're still looking at part number two, which is your cylinder, we're going to start um, developing the strategy. And so when I come up with a strategy, it could be different than yours. In the same way, Chevy will build their cars differently than Ford. It's just the way the world works. Everyone's got their own plan and what makes sense for them. So, but even when I'm working as a machinist on a CNC, all these same principles are pretty much uh, universal. So this is the way I like to work through it. All right. If someone just gives me a drawing and says, "Here, you have to make this," there's a few questions that go through my mind um, on how I'm going to do this because I need to have a plan. The last thing you want to do is start cutting on some material and find out you have to go backwards and try to do something else, which. It may sound complicated, but sometimes the process can only flow in one direction. If you have to back up and do something else, you could really be putting yourself in a bind. All right, so the first question I usually ask myself is, how many setups? And you may have not heard that term yet, but a setup is any time I put a part in my work holding, whether it be the vise or the chuck on the lathe or whatnot. Anytime I can hold the material and do work, that's one setup. Now, if I have to take that part out of that setup, maybe flip it over or turn it on its end or, uh, or whatnot, that's a different setup, okay? So I have to think of how many setups. So right here, I kind of tried to do my best at drawing this cylinder, all right? And so I have to ask myself, how many setups do I have? Well, the first thing you can do is, it may be easier to look at your prints, but right here on this front face, I can, we've got a hole, a smaller hole, and a little area that's been trimmed back, all right? I'll call that a little flat, all right? A little flat that's put on here. All of those features can be accomplished in the same setup. I'll just hold it right here. I can drill this hole, drill this hole, and mill that flat. All in one setup. Okay? I don't have to keep I don't have to drill this hole, take it out, put it back in, drill this next hole, take it in, and put it back into the vise and mill that flat. No. I can hold it once and do all three of those features all in the same setup. The other feature that we've got is a hole that comes in through the bottom. Well, I can't drill these holes and do this flat and also come in from the side of it and drill these. It's not possible. All right, so that's going to be a different setup. I'm going to have to actually take this out, stand it on its edge, and then be able to drill that hole. Okay, so that tells me I've got two setups setup to do uh, all the features on this first face and then there's also this hole that goes to the bottom where your piston will go all right so how many setups I've got two so now that I know that I've got two I have to look at I've got a piece of blank stock right so far this should just be a square piece of material you have trimmed it down to its proper length so far 
Um, I believe that was in lab number six or so. I take that back. So we have to look at which setups are going to work out best for us in which order. All right. Without going too into too much detail, what I like to do is I like to do this bottom hole first. All right. I like to do this bottom hole. It is a. I the reason I like doing that is because right here this hole is a really tiny hole. I didn't. It doesn't look tiny here on the board, but in real life it's a really really tiny hole. I think it's what? It's only a sixteenth. All right. So it's a really tiny hole. I know from my personal experience, and this is where experience comes into play, that these little tiny drills like to break. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to drill this hole first from the bottom and then for my next setup I know I'll have this little hole and then that means that little hole I only have to drill it will end up intersecting this hole that I've already had put in there. That means I'm only having to drill as little as possible with this drill because eventually it will pop through this hole that that's coming up um, through our piston board okay so from experience i know little drills like to break so if i if i did this front face first i'd have to drill that hole deep enough or what i think would be deep enough that it would intersect with the hole here okay i just don't like doing that i like drilling this hole first and then knowing all I'm drilling is the material that I need to make that hole intersect. All right. So what, so my order of setups, I'll go like, I'll just say, I'll do the bottom. I'll do the back bottom bore first. And then my next one will be, um, we'll just call this the face. All right. So that would be number one. And all the features here will be my second step. All right. I hope that makes sense to you. The next thing I got to look is for is critical features. All right, sometimes, uh, well, me as a machinist, I don't always understand. I'll just get a print and I won't know what this part is intended to do. It's always helpful if you know what parts are intended to do. That way, you can figure out what, what critical features are, okay? So, if we look at the critical features here, what do you think they are? Well, I would say that for critical features, this bore right here would be a critical feature, okay? Because if I know this is a cylinder, I know my piston's going to be going in and out of the cylinder, that's going to be a very important surface, right? We're going to want that nice and smooth. You don't want the inside of this bore to be all jaggedy and then your piston would get caught up on it, all right? You can look at your drawing, and that will give you a good idea, right? The way this is dimensioned, it says it's a 0 0.2510 plus 1 minus nothing on this bore, all right? That, that's one of those things that says to me, when I look at a drawing, if it's tightly tolerant, to me, that's the designer or the engineer or whatever saying hey this is critical okay so this is a critical feature for me just due to its tight tolerance there's also this one also has is uh, dimensioned in four decimal places again to me I know I'll have to ream that because it's such a tight tolerance that must be a critical feature all right 
the reason this is going to be a critical feature here is because this is going to ride on that little pin that's been threaded on both ends, all right? So we've got a 3 16 pin that this, this whole thing is going to uh, go back and forth. It's going to be pivoting along this, all right? So again, we want that to be nice and smooth and controlled and not sloppy where our, uh, where our cylinder is flopping all over the place, okay? So that it's going to be tightly constrained here and tightly constrained along the, the piston. All right. So I would say those two are the, the big critical features. There's also, it doesn't really say very much in the drawing, but this distance I know is going to be critical. All right. As I just said with the tolerance stack, when we dimension it from hole to hole like this, the location of those two holes tells me that these two holes, whether they move up or down on this um, cylinder, isn't as important as the distance between those two holes. All right. So that's going to be this distance right here is somewhat critical. All right, not as critical as this bore and this um, ream toll right here, okay? But I would keep that in the back of my mind while making this, all right? So we just identified there's gonna be, well, I'll say there's two critical features. This one's just a kind of, uh, the hole spacing is somewhat critical, all right? Then, the last thing I want to think about is my location of an origin, all right? Because at some point, we're going to have to edge find or, or apply some sort of a, somehow get an origin off of this part. This part's pretty easy. It's just a, it's just a square, you know, 3 eighths by 3 eighths. So it's pretty easy to edge find on this. So. Uh, if I had a more complicated part than this, sometimes you get parts that have are all crazy or they have to be moved at cer certain angles and it's difficult to get a origin on that. So you have to think about how you um, get your origin. This will be pretty easy. So we'll, um, we'll talk about this more in just a second. Um, it's something that I try to plan for if I have a really tricky looking part. And this is not this is not a tricky looking part. So let me clean the board off and then we'll start working through the different steps. Alright, the different setups. Because I like now that I know I've got two setups, I'd like to plan each setup. Alright? I'll be right back. Alright. We're in the process of coming up with a process plan for these parts. All right, like I did said before, my first setup I like to do is the bore for the piston. All right, so I start writing these out, separating them by my different setups. Then I'll have something uh, written down that says I've thought about this. And then at the machine, I can follow the steps that I've come up with. All right, so it's important. Actually, next week, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of information. You'll have no, you'll know how to do all of the different features. You'll know how to make the part. It would just be on you to make the plan, all right? And your plan may be different from my plan, but um, we can compare notes and see whose is better or worse, and maybe yours is better than mine. But I'm just going to give you an example of my process plan for this cylinder for this week, all right? So, like I said, first setup, I like to do this counter board. So I'll just draw, excuse me, it's not a counter board, it's the board for the piston, all right? I like to just give a simple little drawing, all right? Oftentimes, I'll put in where I like to get an origin from, all right? I think, 
I'll put an origin there. It's a pretty simple, it's just a square here, so there's only but so many places you can put it. So I'll just choose that corner, all right? And now I gotta think about how am I gonna hold this, all right? So obviously none of this can be uh, machined if it's not being held by something. So we have to think of how we're gonna hold this. Well, we're gonna hold it in the vise, but we're gonna have to stand it up vertically, okay? Vertically like this, all right? So, WH just means my work holding. What am I gonna hold this with? On the lathe, we were using the three-jaw chuck. Here, we've been using primarily uh, the vise, all right? So vise, and I'm gonna just say vertically, all right? So I know which orientation I have to put this, all right? There's also one thing we're gonna to have to do, all right? Since we're holding this vertically, what we don't wanna do is put it in the vise and have it be uh, at an angle and then trying to drill, all right? Because that's gonna change the way our piston travels in our cylinder. So we are going to want to go um, and get this as vertical as possible. But when you're holding it, you could, um, in the vise, you could put it like that if you were just to put it in. All right. So just a, I would just have a little mental note. We're going to have to indicate. I'm going to have to indicate that vertically. All right. Well, I can't just throw it in the machine and expect that part to be straight up and down. All right, so the next thing I got to look at is what kind of feature that I've got here. All right, we've got this uh, bore here that's got a tightly controlled dimension. Okay, so when it's out in the fourth taller or fourth decimal place, that tells me right off the bat that it needs more precision than what a drill is going to be able to achieve. So I'm going to have to ream it. All right. So, there's only one feature here, so I've only got one sort of operation. So, OP1, operation one, will just be a reaming operation. All right, now the next thing I like to think about is what kind of tools am I gonna need, right? It's all well and good if you know what, uh, what you have to do, but if you don't have the tools to do it, you're not gonna be able to achieve it. So. Working through tools saves a lot of time and a lot of money in industry because if I got this part and I had to make this and I, my boss man didn't have the tools I need, I'd have to tell him and then he'd have to go order it and then I'd have to wait for it and then all this confusion. So in a part that should only take maybe an hour to make, now I'm waiting a few days to make it, okay? So if I've thought about this before it even gets onto the machine, and I know which tools I need, I can get those ordered ahead of time. Or if you've designed something for junior and senior design, if you know which tools you need, you can come down to the machine shop and say, hey, do you have this size reamer or this size drill? Do you have this or that? And if we do, great. Design, keep designing it the way you have. If we don't, unless you want to buy it out of your own pocket, then I would try to come up with a different design because we're not going to order it for you. So uh, it's always good to design around the tools you have. Now, if we were doing this for money, then I would say, let's go order it. We'll make some money. We'll make our money back. But that's a, that's a different story. So coming up with the tool list is very critical. That way you don't uh, get trapped and you can't make this part. All right. So, the first thing I know with any reaming uh, operation, we're going to have to drill. And anytime we drill, we're going to have to center drill. All right? So, we're going to need a center drill. All right? And then we're going to need to drill this out. But, 
I don't know which drill I need yet, right? We've gone through the steps on how to def how to figure out which drill you need versus with which reamer, okay? I obviously know I'm going to need a reamer. I know I'm going to need a reamer. So, I've got to figure that part out. All right. So when we're thinking about this, I always like to figure out the reamer first, all right? So since we got this tolerance, I like to aim on the low side. So right here, I'm going to use a, two, a 0 0.2510 reamer, all right? That way, if it gets a little bit bigger, it's OK as long as it's not over a thou bigger, all right? So my reamer needs to be it. 0 0.2510 reamer. That will be my size. And now I'll, from that, I'll take my seven to ten thousandths off to get a drill size. We'll go to the drill chart. I don't have one in here where I'm at right now, but the letter C, the letter C drill has a diameter of 242. All right, so these are the three tools I'm gonna to need to achieve this. All right, so that will save me some time. I'll be able to get these tools before I even start on this, okay? So, and another thing I like to do is, since we're already thinking about these about how we're going to make this. I like to come up with an idea of how much, uh, how deep I have to drill things, okay? It saves me from having to do the math at the machine, all right? So, we know we're going to have to drill and then ream. Obviously, the center drill only goes in so far. So I want to figure out how far, how deep I want to drill this. All right. So if you look at your drawing on the side view here, um, I guess it would be the right side view. It has the dimension 0.69 plus 30 thousandths minus nothing. All right. So that's a one-way tolerance, okay? What that means is we're going to have to drill this amount, all right? But we need to actually go further past that because we've got the drill point, all right? If we just went to this value, there's a chance that the drill point wouldn't be where it needs to be. It wouldn't be able to intersect this small hole that we're going to do on setup two. All right, so I like to figure out how deep we got to go. Another thing with this is I can't just say, well, I'll just drill it all the way through and be done with it. All right, because if this drill point gets up and intersects with this through hole that we'll put in afterwards, when we put air in here, it's not going to push down on the cylinder. It's just going to escape out of this hole. All right, so I know my drill tip needs to land somewhere in this area, all right? So what I like to do is figure out my depth, okay? So I know I'm going to have to go, my depth is going to have to be 0 0.69 What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the top end of this, all right? I'm going to want to go as deep as possible because really the worst thing that could happen is that my drill tip isn't far enough to intersect with this hole, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and just go the full 30 thousandths, all right? So that's going to be for this dimension right here. Ah. Uh, then we also have to add in the drill tip. And right here, our drill tip, it, our, our drill diameter is 0.242. If we take 30% uh, of that, it's going to be 73 thousandths. So if you add those all up, 
let's see, you'll get 0.793. All right. So that's the target depth I'd like to go to. All right. Now, that would be the maximum you want to go. But in theory, we could go a little bit deeper, okay? Only because how deep this hole or this bore is doesn't really matter. I mean, our piston's only going to stroke up and down, but so far, all right? But we don't want to drill so far. I've seen it. People go a little bit. They go way past this. And then when they drill too far, they get into this hole. So I like to just establish that that is like once you once you get to that um, that amount, this part, no matter what you do afterwards, is not going to come out right. So to do that, all I did was just do this 938.938 to the center of the hole. This is a 0.1885 hole. So we're just going to take off that radius or half the diameter of that hole, right? So you'll have that 0.938 minus the radius of that hole or half the hole diameter, which would be 094, which gives you 0.8445. Max. All right. That would be maximum, maximum, maximum. All right. So, what I what I typically do at the machine is I'd like to just cheat a little bit above this, but no, I I don't want to get anywhere close to this value. All right. There have been times where people, when they're making this part, um, have gone deeper than this, but they didn't know how far they went and then they actually didn't uh, went over the max like they went 893 instead of 793 they didn't know it until they turned it over and started doing the whole face the next setup and only to find out that they went too deep all right so I like to just have that on hand so I'm going to take my letter C drill and I'm going to, to a depth of point, I'll just say 800, all right? A depth of 800. All right, it would be 7,000 over the maximum allowable, but for this, because I know how this design works, I can say, well, I'd go a little bit more. So I'm going to want to go down 800, all right? And then this reamer, you won't really have a depth on this, all right? It will be more of a feel thing. We'll just go until you feel it hit the bottom and then come on out. So I'm not really worried about the reamer depth. So instead of one, this is everything that we've got. We've got it in the vise that will indicate vertically. We'll have a reaming operation. And we've got three tools, a center drill, a C drill, and a 251. And we know we're going to have to drill it to a depth of 800 thousandths. So that's all we have for setup one. Just give me a second and I'll uh, write out setup two. All right, we're going to wrap up this part with our last setup, setup number two. So with setup number two, we've got different features. So even though we know they're all going to go together, we kind of have to come up with a game plan as to which feature will make sense to go on first. All right. So for me, I like to do, uh, I would normally like to do the critical features first. However, in this instance, we have this little tiny hole. And this little tiny hole I know is going to be a problem because it's such a small drill. And if I break it, it could scrap the part. And so I'd like to do the things that could end up scrapping the part. I like to do those first. That way I'm not so involved. I haven't gotten all the time into this. Uh, so 
Uh, I'll do that one first, okay? So, I'll do that one first, all right? Which, if I've already got a drill in here, and I'm already at this location, I've already, I'll already have the drill chuck in the machine, I can just come over here and drop this hole in, all right? So it makes sense to keep, to drill all the holes that you can, all right? They're a similar operation, obviously a different drill, same operation, however, um, so or similar, so I'll just do that. And my third feature will be this flat out here, all right? So this is, we already knew that going into this when we were looking at it earlier, that this flat was not identified as a uh, critical feature, which should be apparent because it's got a very loose tolerance on the print. All right, so the first thing, what are we going to do? How are we going to hold this? Well, we're going to hold it in the vise horizontally. Right, we're going to have it, we had it like this that we indicated in. Now we're going to Lay it down horizontally in the vise. All right. So my first operation is going to be this. All right. Again, if I can, if it breaks this little drill, then it may ruin the part. It may not. If it does ruin the part, it's a, it's not great. But at least I haven't put in the effort in making these other two features. All right. So this first one is going to be what? Just a regular drilling operation, right? Just a regular drilling operation. There's no uh, tight tolerances, so it doesn't need to be reamed. All right. So what are the tools we're going to need? Obviously a center drill. All right. And we're going to need a 16th inch drill. Right? That's the dimension for that hole. It's a 16th inch. And that's all we're going to have to do. But, but actually, let me back up just a half a step. We have to figure out where our origin is going to be. Right? Where is our origin going to be? All right, so this is about the only time that where your origin is going to matter, right? Because We've already cut a feature on a different face. Now how we orient this and find our origin is going to be critical. All right. If you look at all the drawings, which way are all of the dimensions pulled from? All right. This is the end that has the bore down in. All right. For so you know where we're looking at. And this would be the top side. All right, so where are all the dimensions coming from in the drawing? They're all coming from the bottom, all right? So that tells me I want, at least I want my origin to be on this face, all right? It wouldn't make sense if everything is referenced off of here, off of this edge, to make an origin on this edge, all right? So I know I'm going to want somewhere on here. All right, somewhere on here. Now, for me, I'll just put it there. All right, that's where I'll put my origin. I could do it down here if I so chose to, but what you don't want to do is here. All right, this is the benefit of kind of drawing this out. All right, that way I've got a visual print kind of something that I drew out and I know exactly how I'm going to have this oriented in the vise. Obviously, if the bore was on this side, all right, if we put it in our machine 180, right, we would have wanted the origin on this side. So this is why I kind of like drawing things out, all right, because I know I need to come off of this edge. 
right? This is how I will want to lay it in my vise and how all my features are going to lay on there. So these are just some little strategies to help you out. All right, so how deep do we want to drill this drill? Get my, well, we have this bore coming in, right? We should have had it something, something like that. All right, so it needs to intersect. All right, so how far does it need to go? It just needs to go till it intersects. All right. Once you feel it break through, don't keep drilling and finding that hole. All right. Because again, if this thing breaks, uh, it'll break off in that little hole and plug it up, and you can't drill over a broken drill. So be very be very careful when you're breaking through, okay? Just go down till it intersects, and once you feel it break through, let's, uh, let's get done with the drilling, all right? So we'll have this hole. And from our prank, we should be able to figure out how far we have to go, okay? How far we have to go. Even though this is dimensioned up to this hole, and then he, and then a dimension back to the small hole, we don't actually want to machine it like that. Why do we not want to? All right. So when we come up with our strategy, yes, some people I often get people say, "Let's do this big hole first, and then the second hole," because that's the way it's dimensioned. All right. They'll want to make this big hole and then come back, make the little hole. Well, what's going to be the problem with that? There's a very, very big problem that's going to occur. I hope you can, you know what it is. It's going to be the backlash, okay? Anytime we're driving our axes in one direction, we want to keep going in that direction as as often as we can, all right? What we don't want to do is go down and then come back, all right? So to make this origin, right, we'll have to have our edge finder. We'll just worry about this X direction. We'll have to have the tool and we'll have to be bringing the edge finder this way until it stops, all right? So it's going like this and then, oh, right there, we found the edge. We're going in this direction, all right? So we want to keep going in that direction. So what, the reason why we don't have number, the big hole as the first one, is because we have to go all the way down, and then when we turn back, our backlash could have more than the five thousandths um, error than what's allowed by um, our tolerances, okay? So that's why we're going to hit this one first and then on our way to the next one. So it's very, so I know manufacturing and dimension go hand in hand, but you can invert the steps, all right, in manufacturing. This will actually give us a much more accurate part to go here and then keep going to here get to this hole, all right? If that, I hope that makes sense. We definitely do not want to go down and come back. We'll have incorporated all that backlash, all right? So, what we can do is just do the math, take that and subtract out uh, where this X location is, all right? So this one's put 0.938. I guess I should have done this already. All right. Do, 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 do. And then this is 0.281. So this will give us an X location of 
0.657. All right. So you know, if this is zero, we're going to go want to go to um, going to go to 0.657 um, to do this first one. All right. So if you do all this math out first, it's easier to do it here on a piece of paper where you can erase than do it at the machine. Type something in wrong. And then if the part's already, you know, drill it, you've already messed up the part if you've messed up the map, okay? So, I'd like to draw it out first, all right? So, that's, that's the little hole, all right? So, the next hole we're going to go to is the big one, all right? And if we look at the print, we can see it's at four decimal places. So, we're going to know this next operation on this next hole is going to be a ring a reaming operation. All right, so what are our tools for this? We know we're going to need the center drill. All right. We know we're going to need that, we're going to use that 1885 reamer again. Okay. And so we still got to figure out which drill we're going to use. All right. We've already done the 1885 reamer before. Last time we did it, we used the number 16 drill. So that's. We've already made a feature like this before. So that's where I'm getting the numbers from. All right. The 1885 reamer and the number 16 drill. All right, so how far are we going to drill this? Well, this feature goes all the way through the part, right? So, so I'll just write through, all right? We're going to just drill this all the way through that part and then ream it, obviously, all the way through as well, all right? So then now we'll have that one in. Now, the last thing we're going to do is this, this little flap, all right? So what are we going to have to do with how are we going to make this flat? We're going to have to use an end mill, right? So, this is going to be a milling operation. We're going to have to get a mill, all right? And then what size would we want to use? Or what kind of tool? In our toolbox, we've got a 3 8 end mill. That's the one I like to use. You can use a half inch or whatever. But all we're going to do with this is we're going to bring, I'm not so worried about my origin anymore because once we take our, uh, we'll end up taking our drill chuck out and everything and put a collet in there with an end mill. Uh, our origin is still good, but we really don't need it, all right? All we're going to do is just bring the end mill There, let's get, let's get, make it blue. All right, we'll just get our end mill like this. We'll just go until it touches, all right, along this edge, all right, and then we can just move it in that amount, all right, which that dimension is 0.56. Plus 30 minus nothing. All right, so we can just get that right. That's there's no math to that. We just can get that straight from the drawing. So what we'll end up doing is going until this thing is right there at that line. All right. One thing we're going to want to do though is if this is right here, if our end goes right there where it needs to be, we're going to have to move it in the y axis just so we're not left with a shoulder that's got an arc on it, all right? So we'll just move it in the Y just to clean that shoulder and make it nice and square, all right? So this milling is a real easy step. It should only take a couple of, a couple of seconds, all right? So uh, just to recap here for the setup. So we looked at everything figured out which strategy we want to, want to go with, 
we got our different operations, we got them written down. I know exactly which tools and which order I'm going to do it. All right, so this is the way I'll follow it when I give the, the demonstration at the machine. So uh, give me a few minutes and we'll meet you down at the machine. All right, so we're back here in the machine shop and we're getting ready to make our cylinder. This is lab 11. And right here, since we've already done our process plan and we decided all the tools that we need, I went ahead and got them all laid out to verify that I do have all the tools that I need, right? Because you're not gonna wanna start a project only to find out you don't have the tool. Because again, anytime you take uh, a material out of your work holding device, whether that be uh, a vise here on a mill or the three jaw chuck and a lay that never goes in the same way you had it. So I did, but I did verify I've got all of the things that we need, which I discussed in the whiteboard lab. I did draw, I did color these soft or these hard jaws on the vise. Um, I don't. That's not a normal thing that we do. We just did it here because it shows up best on camera and will give you a little bit of contrast. All right. I've also got my material that I've already cut down to length that you did in lab number eight. So this is our 3 8 square stock and it's already been trimmed to the length and be burned. All right, so this should already be something that you have. All right, so we'll start with setup number one, all right, which was having the cylinder vertically in the vise, all right? So what I'm going to need for that is some parallels just to get it up comfortably above the surface, all right? So I'll lock this in, but I don't want it too tight, all right, because remember, we don't want to accidentally put it in there and put the board down at a weird angle, right? We want this to be as vertical as possible, all right? This board for the piston, it's pretty important that it goes in there straight. So I've just kind of got it in there so it holds it, but I can still kind of wiggle it around a bit, all right? So what I will do, so I will take my dial indicator and get it snugged into my drill chuck here. All right. So we've worked with indicating things side to side, and we've actually um, swept it around a circle. All right. But now we're going to want to use this to find our, how vertical we are. I'd like to get it probably within a couple of thousandths is probably enough. All right. So I'm just going to bring the table around. And what I'll do to, to get this vertical is I will just bring, use the quill to bring down the indicator. I'm just going to move in my X here just to get a reading. All right. All right. So I'll set that at zero. All right. And then from there, I'll loosen this up and then I'll just go up and down on the surface with, with my quill, all right? And I'll notice any sort of change in the needle. All right? So as I, at the top, I'm at zero, and as I go down, I'm at zero right here. All right, so right here I have the dial set. The needle is at the top 
of my part. I'm going to readjust this to zero. And then I'm going to bring the quilt down, down to the bottom part. I won't be able to reach all the way to the bottom. Sometimes the body of the indicator uh, hits your part or the vise, but it should give you some sort of reading. So I'm pretty close to the bottom right now and I'm about to foul off. For me, that's pretty good, okay, from top to bottom. So I'm over that, what, around an inch or so, just under an inch. Excuse me, an inch and a quarter. I'm only off a foul, so I'm pretty close to vertical, as close as I really need to be. Now, if I was five or six or ten thousandths off, I'd want to just tap this around. That's why I left it a little bit loose in the vise. But now that I've got it within two thousandths vertical, I will go ahead and tighten it down. I'll just verify that nothing moved. And it looks pretty good. It looks like I'm still only a thou across that surface. So I'm pretty happy with its verticality. All right, so I'll take, I will take the indicator and put it away. All right, so I've already, so that's our setup for, our setup one. We've got it in the vise and it's tightened down. Now we're going to need the, to ream this, all right? This is going to be our cylinder bore, and it's important that we get it right in the center, as center as possible. So we're going to have to edge find. If you look at your drawing, we're dealing with 3-8 square stock, so we're going to have to Get in the middle of that 3 8 square stock in both the x and y directions. So, all I'm going to do is edge find. zero. This is just my personal preference. I like to set it at zero as a temporary zero. Go ahead and move it my hundred thousandths and then readjust my dial here and make it a permanent zero. All right. So now I've got that zero. Now I want to move to the middle of that three eighths in the X. Okay, so that's 188. We're going to round it to 188. So right there. Sometimes I'll straighten my edge finder and then just bring it down to see if it's, since I'm only in the X, I'm only worried about it being in the center in the X direction. And that looks pretty good. I'm not far off. All right. So now I've got to do my Y.
and that just kicked off there. So, again, I, this is just the way I like to do it. I like to set a temporary zero and move in my 100 to account for half of my edge finder, and then I like to go ahead and re-zero. Alright, so I'm re-zero. Now I need to push the material back, which brings my tool down into the negative Y, 188. So there's 180. Eight. Okay, so that should be good. What I'll do is I'll lock all my clamps, my table locks, and just verify. Make sure when you're verifying, you know, you're just rough verifying with your edge finder that your edge finder needle's not kicked off to the side. I try to just get it close to the center. And if we were off a lot, it would be very apparent. But that looks like we're in the center. All right. So, we'll set our edge finder to the side. And now we'll go and start doing this bore. So, since we're reaming, we're gonna need to drill it. And since we're drilling, we're gonna wanna center drill this. So I've center drilled this. And now we've got to drill. And we had a specific drill depth we wanted to go to. So this is going to be the first time we've ever had to control the depth of our drill. Okay? So. Okay. So this is my letter C drill, all right? And what we're gonna wanna do is control our depth, right? So we wanted to go down about 800, 800 thousandths, okay? So the way we do that is we can bring the tool down and just touch the part. The, the motor's off, it's not running. All I'm doing is just bringing it down and making contact with the top of the part. And then I'm going to lock, lock that in place. So it's just touching. All right, I've got my quill lock on. Now this is where we start using this quill stop. Okay, as you can see, when I move my quill, this little, uh, I'm not sure what you would call that, some sort of a nut of some sort, travels along with with the quill, all right? So when I bring that down, all right, I've just moved around the machine just so you can see uh, a little bit clearer what's happening here, because we're gonna have to control our depth of our drill to 800 thousandths. So what I'm gonna do is just move this quill down until it makes contact with the top of the part, like so, and then I'll, and I'll lock the quill. That way, is when I let go, it doesn't spring back up. So we've essentially made that top of the part a zero. All right. When, if you notice, when I do use this quill and bring it down, this portion right here of the quill moves along with the quill, right here. All right. So when I lock this, now I can use my quill stop, which are, is this part right here. 
And all I'll do is I'll just move it up till it makes contact with this piece right here. All right? Just like that. All right? You also have this little lock nut that comes along and will follow it. It's a good idea to use that as well. It keeps your quill stop from moving. All right? So I've locked that in. I'm not really concerned at all with these uh, these graduations here. Okay, we're not going to even worry about that. So now, if I release this, this part is going to bottom out at the same time it touches the top of my car. All right. So I've controlled the the uh, the stroke of my quill right now. So what I can do is now I can move the table up my 800 and then when I come down into this material it's going to stop when it hits this quill stop but we have raised the part up 800 so that would mean I'm drilling 800 thousandths down in the hole. So let me move around and what I'll do is I'll zero this my knee, all right? I'll zero the knee out. And then now I'll raise it 800, all right? When you do this, you gotta make sure you have enough travel in your quill that when you bring it up, your 800 thousandths, your, your part's not hitting the, the drill, all right? So, this has each full turn is a hundred thousand, so I'll have to obviously go eight full turns, all right? So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all right? So now I've brought my whole table up 800, so now when I, let me walk around here. Now, you can see when I bring it to the top of the park, I still have a gap before it gets to my stop here. That should be 800 thousandths, all right? From this point, all we're gonna need to do is just drill it, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. we're getting close to our wheel stop here. A couple more pecs and we should be at the bottom. Okay, right there. I've hit the bottom and I've stopped. So that's as far as that drill can go. Alright. So, we just drilled 800 down into this part. Okay. So from there, now we're going to have to ream this. So when I ream this, I want this quill stop out of the way. I don't want anything, I don't want my quill to stop before I get to the bottom of that drill hole, all right? So I'll just scoot that out of the way. And then now what I want to do is I want to use a, a bit of feel, okay? So I'm going to ream this down until I feel it hit the bottom. It should have a very uh, distinct feeling when you hit the bottom. 
If you go too far, it's going to start to uh, oblong your hole because you're trying to shove this reamer down in there. It's going to want to bend and it overbores your hole, over reams it, I guess. So. So I'm just going to go until I feel it hit the bottom. Nice and slow in. I felt it hit the bottom. And now I will bring it out. Okay. I'll bring it out. I'm going to take my tool because before I take this out, it's very important that we do this before we take it out. We need to make sure the depth of this is right. All right. Because if we don't make this bore deep enough, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is when the piston is in its stroke, if, it's, if the bore, if this bore is too shallow, uh, your piston is going to tag the inside at top dead center. Or it might not even make it to top dead center because uh, there's too much material still down in here. So we do have some gauges available to us. All right, we have these gauges down in the shop. All right, all it is, is this section right here goes down into the bore, and as long as this section fits completely down into the bore, then uh, we know we've done it deep enough. All right, so that's what I'll check now. Let me get all of these chips out of the way. So it should slide right in there. And if I've done this right, it should sit right at the top surface or below. So it may be difficult for you to see on camera, but my gauge slips just under, just barely under this surface here, okay? If you put yours in and it only goes in this far, then you're gonna have to go back in with your drill and reamer and just do a little bit more. At that point, it's going to be a lot of trial and error to get it um, for this to get in there. Insert it all the way. All right. These will be available. You just have to talk to your instructor, and he'll have one for you. All right. So I'll put that away. My ream right now is good. All right. It was plenty deep. So the one thing I'll do right here. Since we've already got it lined up, is I will just chamfer this hole ever so slightly, just to break that edge and be burr. Okay, we just deburred that hole, so I can leave this out. All right, so that's it for setup number one. Now we'll move to setup number two. Setup number two had us laying this down vert or horizontally, rather. All right. So we always want to clear these chips out. I'm going to choose slightly larger parallels. Put them in here. All right. If I can, I always want to clamp in the center of the vise. And right now, there's nothing that would keep me from, from doing that. It's an important kind of how you want to lay this in here, okay? Um, right now I've got my, my piston bore on the left side, all right? So since all the dimensions are pulled from the bottom side, which is this board side, 
this is where I want to start making my, I want to edge find off of that side, right? Conversely, if I had it over here, where the bore side is on the right side, I'd want to edge find here and then move that way, right? Because that's where all the dimension, that's the edge that all the dimensions are pulled off. Of. Okay, since we put this bore in here and we tried to get it as true to center as possible, what may have happened is it may not be exactly on center, okay? It may not be on center either by something you did or the fact that this is not exactly 3 8 squared, okay? So what I want to do is measure right here the smallest portion of this sidewall on each of these faces, all right? So, what I'll do is I'll stick my calipers in there and measure the, the wall thickness on each side of this board, all right? So that one's about 60 thousandths. This one's 62. That one's 60. And this one's 54, or something around there. So I want to go back to my biggest one, which is this side right here. This side measured the biggest or the thickest from the center of that board to the outside. I want to have that sticking up, all right, when I place this in here. So if it's handy for you, you can make a swipe, uh, swipe with the Sharpie like this. And I say that's the surface that I want up, all right? And I'll just place this in here, like so. So we want to keep it close to the center of the vise as possible. There's nothing, there's no reason why we can't have it close to the center, all right? We can edge find on all the sides. Now when we edge find with this, I've got the bore hole right now on the left side. So that's the side that all of the dimensions are drawn off on our drawings. All right. So that's the edge I want to edge find. Conversely, if I had this flipped over and the bore was on this side, I'd want to edge find uh, in this direction. But I have got it on the left side. So I will be edge finding on this left side. So we're going to edge find my left side. Again, that's my bore side. So that's the edge. I will set a temporary zero. Then move it in a hundred thousandths and set my permanent zero. This is just the way I like to work. I like setting a temporary zero and then have a permanent zero. That way I'm not adding too many numbers. Anytime I have to do a lot of math at the machine, that's when uh, errors happen. All right, I'll just bring down my edge finder just verify that I moved in the correct direction. I can see that the edge of my cylinder and the edge of, is lined up with the center of my edge finder. All right, so I've got my X zero. Now I need to do my Y zero. that I didn't bring it down enough where I hit the, the 
withdrawals of the vice. And I'm still making contact with the heart. All right, just kicked. So, I'll set a temporary zero. Move a hundred thousandths. And then set a permanent zero. So if I bring this down, this back edge should be right in the center of my edge finder, which it is. Now if I bring this back out over here to this zero, I'm at zero, zero, and that's exactly where I wanted my origin, in the upper left corner, if you're looking straight down from the top, okay? I can bring this down, and you can see that it intersects it through the center that way, and also in the Y. All right, so that's good. Now what we'll want to do is move to the center of this part in the Y. All right, so to do that, again, these are 3 8 square, so I want to move it to uh, 0.188, 188 thousandths. There's 188 thousandths, and I'm going to lock my Y, because all these features right now are all on the same, on the same uh, Y. All right, which is the center of the part, which we can see right there where we're at. All right. So now I have to go and get to the first operation on this setup, on setup number two, is to drill the little 16th inch hole. All right, 16th inch hole. So now we're gonna have to move in our X, 657 thousandths. And remember I got that by going, uh, taking the 0.938 and subtracting the 281. All right, that gives us 657. So what I will do is move in 657. That's 200. 400, 600, 57, right there. So I moved in 657, all right? So right there I may do, do my 16th inch drill. All right, we're still going to need to center drill it. Instead of using the big number two center drill that we've been using so far this semester, the point on this number two is much larger than the 16th inch drill we want to drill with. All right, so what we're going to do is use a number one, which is much smaller. All right, maybe you can see the difference there. Get my fingers out of the way. This is the number two that we've been using. This is a number one. It's got a much smaller point uh, that's not as big as the 16th inch drill. So this is the one I want to choose. All right, it's just this little guy. It's called a number one center drill. That's just its size. this down and make a little center drill. I'm sorry if my arm is in the way. What I like to do is before I commit too much to that, I want to measure it out. 
okay? Right now, all I have is just a little spot right in the top of this part. So I know I had to go down 657. So what I'll do is I'll open up my calipers to read 657. There's 657. What I can do is I can use this right here, this little thumb screw to lock there. All right, now, now my calipers don't move. All right, and what I'll do is I'll just put one jaw on the place where I edge found, and then this other jaw should be right in the center of where the where I made that center drill, which it looks perfect to me. All right, if you're way off, you may want to figure out what you did wrong. Okay, it should be right there. All right, so I like that location as being correct. So what I'll do is I'll actually center drill it just a little bit more, but not a whole lot. All right, so I just went a little bit deeper with that center drill because I found that that location was good. All right, I don't want to touch any of my handles to move my table. I just want to get my 16th inch drill. Okay, you can see how thin this is. It's a really small guy. This is the problem that makes these things break pretty easily because they're so small. And that's usually what ends up happening to people is that they scrap their parts because they break the tips off of these and lodge them down in the hole and it doesn't want to come out. Okay, so be very, very careful with this. All right, I like to chuck mine up pretty tight and high in, into the drill chuck. If we have it long and dangly, it's gonna become real unstable, all right? Right here, if I can get up right where the, the flutes of the drill meet the shank and plant, um, grip it right there. It makes it as rigid as I need it to be for this operation, okay? So this one, this hole has to intersect that bore hole that we made, okay? So once I feel it break through, I wanna stop. Stop and get out of the hole. No more dancing around in there because that's how your drills will get broken, all right? Go nice and easy. And right there, I felt it break through. Let me wipe that off, and maybe you can see the hole. It's a really tiny hole. All right, so we've made that hole. I broke through, and that's. I don't want to tag the other side of that hole. All right, so we've made that hole. Now. My next operation, operation two and setup two, is to ream this hole, all right? So I need to finish going that full 938 thousandths, if you can see that on your drawing, all right? So this will take me to 800, Nine hundred nine thirty eight. And I can lock my x axis. All right. This is a slu this is a larger hole, so it can go back to the number two center drill. And again, I'm just making a small little spot because I want to always verify my holes. So I'll open up my calipers to 938. All 
right? I locked it up, opened it up to 938. I'll use this thumb screw right there and I'll measure and just verify, all right? That looks good. This, this is on the edge and this anvil right here is right in the middle of that spot face that I, or that little uh, little center drill that I did. Just a little mark. So that looks good. That gives me confidence that I'm right where I need to be. All right, so I will finish center drilling. So there is that. Now we need to use that number 16 drill for the through hole. All right. Got my number 16 drill. I'll just double check. Yes, it is the right one. All right, since we're going to go through, this is a through hole, we always have to know what's on the back side of our part. Anytime you're drilling through something, you have to really know what am I going to hit on the back side. All right. So for this, if I drill this all the way through right now, I'm going to hit these parallels. Okay, so what I'll have to do is just verify that your vise is nice and tight. All right. Then we can remove the parallels just for this operation, okay? Now there's other than this being clamped in, which there's a lot of force clamping in here, there's nothing that's helping it to, um, on the back side to hold it up, other than just clamping it, the clamping force, all right? So when you drill this, be very careful that you don't drill so hard that you actually turn your piece, all right? That would be bad news. That would be bad news. So just take it kind of light and easy, all right? I've seen a lot of people get real aggressive with this and actually push their part down into the vise and it kicks their whole part like this and then they have to pretty much restart. All right. Again, I'm just letting the drill do the feeding in, okay? It's kind of a feel thing. Let's stop this for a second. I got a chip around and around, okay? I'm not pressing too hard. I'm just kind of letting the drill feed its way in. Broken through. So there we go. I can take that out and now I can read. All right, I've got that in there. Just going to slowly bring through this, be nice and controlled. All right, I felt it break through and I'm just coming right out. So that should be a good ream toll. One way we can check to see if we use the right reamer is if you take your number two center drill, all right, ground down to 3 16 so. That's going to match the pin that we're that's going through there. You can see that it fits, all right? If yours doesn't fit down there, 
you either didn't ream it all the way or used the wrong reamer. All right, so that's a good little check. A little check on yourself, okay? So the last operation we got to do is a milling, okay? I always like to have parallels under there. Sometimes once you take them out, it can be a little tricky to get them back in. But if you can get them back in, I suggest it. Only because that keeps this thing from wanting to rock down into the... be a little sticky and difficult with me. If, as long as I got one, I feel good that it will keep it from being pushed down into the vise. Alright? So I got one under there just to support it. Alright? So, the last thing we got to do is mill. Alright? We got to mill the little, little relief, relief area underneath these holes. Alright? Since I'm milling, I can't use the drill chuck, okay? So I've got to take that out. All right, so I've got to take this drill chuck out. All right, just loosen it. Again, only turn it maybe two, three times to keep the threads engaged. Using a 3 8 end mill for this. If you wanted to use your half inch, you could. I like to use things that have four flutes. So if you have a, a four fluted half inch end mill, you could go ahead and use that for this operation. Unfortunately, my two or my um, half inch is only two flutes, so that's why I'm using my three flute, or excuse me, my three eighths with the four flutes. Call it going in. Tool going in. All right. So now my tool's in there. All right. So the way I like to tackle this is a couple different ways, all right? One thing I personally like to do is I like to kiss this face and just clean it up ever so slightly across the whole part. The reason I do that is because uh, it will ensure that this surface and that bore that we put in are exactly 90 degrees, all right? As it may be laying in there, you know, this is all rough stock here, so it could be twisted or turned a little bit. It's got a less than desirable face. And this face right here is gonna actually uh, mate with the body, which we'll get into next week. So the better you can have those smooth and squared up, the better those two are gonna uh, come together. I'm going to have to raise my knee up quite a bit. All right. That should be pretty good. All right. Very good. All right. So, all I'm going to do here is I'm still set up. The center of the spindle is still set up along the center of this part. So I don't have to really find anything in my Y any longer. I'm still set up right over the middle of the part. Okay, so now that we've got our end mill in here, the print doesn't say anything about this, but I like to face this 
just take a very small cut, okay? What that's going to accomplish is it's going to square this face with that bore. Because right now, we're dealing with rough stock all on the outside. So when they uh, make this, they extrude it out in mile-long sections, this, these walls are not really controlled very well, all right? So what I like to do is just kiss it off just to make sure it's nice and flat because this face right here and the face on our body, which we'll get to next week, have to match up, okay? The smoother and squarer we can get those together, those two parts will marry up much better. What we don't want is to have some sort of weird gap which allows air to not pass from the body into this part. So, whenever I want to just do light facing things, what I'll do is I'll color the face that I want cleaned up. So I'll just run this little Sharpie around here. All right, doesn't have to be pretty. All right, but now I've got that surface black, much in the same way we did when we were balancing the crankshaft, all right? So what I'll do is I'll bring my end mill pretty close to the top, and then I'll lock my quill, all right? So it's staying right there, all right? And what I'll do is I'll turn it on, and when I turn uh, the spindle on, uh, I'll raise the table until it just barely touches that surface. All right. So we're on. And now I'm going to raise my knee up until this end mill just barely touches the surface. All right. I could hear it just barely touch. All right. Now I'm just going to move in the X direction. All right. You can see where it's clear, cleaned up a little bit from where I started into this left edge. Hopefully you can see that. But I'm just going to go all the way across the part. And here you go. Here's a perfect example of squaring this thing up. This is why I like to do this. Because I'm not sure if you can see it on camera. But right here, I've cleaned up. I moved all the way across the part, and it did clean up on this edge. All right? So that tells me that either this wasn't laying perfectly flat, or this the, the stock surface on there is, is not exactly square. So what I'll do is I'll just move my knee up maybe two thousandths. So let's just go up a couple thousandths, all right? Just went up a couple of thousandths. And I usually like to go nice and slow across here to try to get the best surface finish possible, all right? Perfect. Perfect, perfect. All right. So now, now my part is, is cleaned up all the way across that face. All right. So now we're going to say that is the top of the part and it's at zero. So what I'll do is I'll set my knee to zero. Say that is the top of the part. Okay. And then now we can look at our drawing and it shows that little step, that little relief area is 30 thousandths deep, okay? So now that I've set my zero, I can now bring my table up in the Z, 30 thousandths. All right, there's 30 thousandths. And then now what I will do, that, that shoulder goes back 0.56, minus nothing, plus 30 thousandths, okay? So what I will do 
is I'm just going to use the, <coughs> excuse me, the edge of my tool uh, to find the edge of this part. Okay? Since that tolerance is pretty wide open, pretty large, all right, I don't have to be too concerned with edge finding and moving around and everything. All we're going to do is just find the edge of the tool, then set our zero from that point, and then move in the 560 to 590. All right? So I'll show you how that looks. All right. So remember, this is 30 thousandths up, so this should just barely touch this part when I get close. All right. Right there, I could just kind of hear it hitting, all right, just barely making contact with the edge of that part. Okay, so sometimes you'll see a chip and sometimes you won't. I just, I could hear it, so what I'm going to do is reset my zero over here. All right, what I'll actually do is back off a little bit so when I start this up, it's not in contact with the material. All right, and then from now, I'm already at my depth, I've already found by zero, and now it's just a matter of going 560 to 590 thousandths, all right? So I, here's the sticking point with a lot of people. A lot of people go so far that they run over that little, that little 16th hole, that first hole we put in right here. If you go over that with this relief, your part's no good. It will never marry up to the body, and you'll have to restart. All right, so if you go 660 or something like that, you're gonna run into that hole and wipe out, that hole will be sunk too deep and then that face will never match up. All right, so be very careful in when you move this that you don't run, um, you don't take this little relief over top of that hole. probably go in about in the middle of that with the middle of the tolerance zone will be about 575 all right so that's where I'll go then I'll be right in the middle of the tolerance zone all right there's my zero I'm just gonna feed this in there's 200 There's 400, there's 500, there's 575. What I'm going to do from there is I'm going to unlock my Y and then move it back and forth like this so I can square that shoulder. If I left it like this, that shoulder is going to take the shape of the end mill and it's going to be around. All right? So I'll just Move it in the Y, back and forth, just to cut and square that shoulder off, all right? I'll also bring it, since I'm using a 3 8 tool and this is 3 8 stock, there may be little slivers on the side. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of make, run over this just to make sure that I don't have any on the both of the edges just to make sure I don't have any extra material there. All right, what I can do is wipe this off. And you can see that I didn't run over that hole. Let me blow this off, maybe it will be. All right. It looks good to me, so I'll raise my tool up here so you can get a better look. You can see that the step didn't run into our hole. All right, it stops here, our hole's here. 
and our larger through hole is right there. So everything looks good. That's everything we had to do on that setup. All right? And that part is complete. The only thing we have to do left is to deburr it. All right? So let me take this out. All right. What I like to do is I don't worry about the small hole because your little chamfer mill here, or countersink, won't get into that hole. But I do like to, just by hand, stick it in the larger hole, and just give it a little twist just to break that edge. And of course, we gotta do it on the back edge as well. All right, so there's our part. What I'm gonna have to do now So I'm going to just take my file and file these edges right here where the mill touched. I'll probably do that off camera because it's a small part and all you're going to see is my fingers. But I'll just take my file and deeper these edges. Okay? And then that's our completed part. There is one check to this to make sure we did everything good, which we'll get to in just a moment. All right, so I deburred these edges right here. All right, all the way around. One thing about this, uh, when we make this little relief cut, sometimes a burr rolls up and onto this face. All right, again, we clean this face off so it's nice and smooth. But if we have that little burr coming up from the back bottom side, it's gonna actually kick our, our face off of the body, which we'll make next week. All right. So what I'll do for that is I'll just get a little emery cloth right here. I'll lay it on the on the vise, and I'll just lay it down. And just real quick, just rub that across there. Again, emery cloth is not much more than sandpaper with the cloth backing. All right. So I can feel now. I can't take my fingernail. Feel a burr, okay? So this face is really good. This face right here is the most important face on this part, all right? So using this and flat sanding it like so cleans that up really nice. All right, so that's our completed part. Okay, so we've deburred all the edges. The one thing that we haven't gotten to is the hole, when we drill this small hole into that bore, it will have left a burr on the inside of this bore. So right now, when I push this, the piston that we have made earlier, and I push that in there, I can feel it get hung up, all right? What I don't want to do is shove that piston and make um, all those burrs get shoved further into the hole. So what I'll do is I'll just take that out I will take my 251 reamer that we use to bore this hole. All right, I'll just put it in by hand and I'll just rotate it by hand. And you'll feel those burrs get caught in between the flutes and it doesn't take much power to get that burr. So I've cleaned up the inside of that board. So now we can check. Now I don't feel a burr. There's one check I like to do before we get to down the road and, and trying to assemble this, all right? This could be a little, helps you to troubleshoot something from the get-go, all right? What I do is I'll take the piston that we've made in, prior, in a prior lab, all right? And I'll insert it into here, into my piston board. One thing I'll do is make sure it does go in. That would be very important, right? And then it moves freely. It should move pretty freely with a whole lot of grab. And to check the fit, what I like to do is I like to insert the pin, cover the hole, and then when I pull the piston out, it should have a pop, pop sound. I'm not sure if you can hear that on camera, but as I pull this out, it has a little pop. That tells me that this bore and this piston are pretty well matched up, all right? If you pull this out and you didn't hear anything, 
It could be that you overboard your hole, all right? That you may want to think about doing it over again, all right? But when I pull that out, I can hear a good, a nice little pop. So I'm happy with that part. I'll put it in my toolbox and wait until assembly.